Uh, our next talk is titled The Intraoperative Vascular Assist, Essential to Surgical Care. And this will be presented by Cassandra Soto from the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. My name is Cassandra Soto and I'm a fourth year medical student at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and I will be presenting the intraoperative vascular assist essential to urgent surgical care. I do not have any disclosures. In 2014, Dr. Michael Bogan's presidential address to the New England Society of Vascular Surgery, he talked about the training of the firemen. And we know that vascular surgeons are often referred to as the firefighters of the OR. Part of the reason for this is that when things go awry in the operating room, Vascular surgeons are often called in to manage unexpected vascular compromise, control bleeding, or to assist with difficult dissections or exposures. And part of the reason vascular surgeons are able to do this is because of the wide breadth of vascular training that allows them to use endovascular, open surgical, and hybrid techniques. So we looked at how others had evaluated this in the past and found that in 2020, Dr. Blackwood's group was able to evaluate 419 intraoperative consultations finding that most commonly they were being consulted by surgical oncology and cardiothoracic surgery. You can see in figure A that they're also being called in by various other surgical subspecialties, and that they're being called in to elective, urgent, and emergent cases. In figure two, you can see that they're being called in for revascularization, control of bleeding, and dissection exposure with overlap between the three groups for the cases that they were called for. They established that vascular surgeons are essential supporting staff to other surgical subspecialists within their institution. So what we wanted to do in our study was not only evaluate the intraoperative consultations, but also those where surgeons were being called preoperatively and informed that they would be needed for vascular assist in a case. And as we wanted to focus on the, in, the more urgent setting, we evaluated the 484 cases retrospectively with a head of vascular surgeon listed as a secondary surgeon with a non-vascular surgeon as primary. We excluded the 350 elective cases. So for the 49 cases that were classified as urgent, the patient had to go to the OR within six hours. And the cases, the 85 cases that were classified as emergent required the patient to go to the operating room within one hour. So when it came to our patient demographics and characteristics, the median age was 56 years old and the patients were primarily male white with BMIs of greater than 25, with about 29% of them actually having a BMI of greater than 30 and falling into an obesity class. And in terms of their ASA class, about 62% of the patients had an ASA class of greater than four. In terms of who was calling our vascular surgeons, primarily it was orthopedic surgery, acute care surgery, and cardiothoracic surgery. However, they were also called in to cases for general surgery, surgical oncology, and plastic surgery, as well as other surgical subspecialties. And in terms of when they were being called, about 44.8% involved being informed preoperatively that they would be needed for assistance, and about 55.2% of them were intraoperative consultations. Acute care surgery and cardiothoracic surgery were more often calling for intraoperative consultations, while orthopedic surgery was more often calling uh, preoperatively and informing for a need of assistance. In terms of the time of day, about 28.4% of the cases occurred after hours, so between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So luckily, most of our surgeons were in-house uh, during the day for most of the cases. So in terms of why they were being called and what they were doing, um, about 35% of the cases were for revascularization, followed by 33% for bleeding. Um, this category of other, interestingly, had about 13.4% of the overall cases. They were IVC filter placements, mostly with orthopedic surgery. And here in the figure on the right, you can see that the reason for consultation did differ amongst the different surgical subspecialties uh, pretty substantially. So when our vascular surgeons were being called in to intervene, um, primarily, they were using an open operative approach in about 71.6% of the cases. Only about 26.1% of the cases involved an endovascular intervention, with very few um, requiring a hybrid approach. And in terms of where anatomically they were operating, they were operating all over the body. However, primarily, they were operating in the lower extremity, the abdomen, and the upper extremity. And with our patient cohort, the overall survival to discharge was 74.6%. 
So what we were able to establish here is that when it comes to the intraoperative vascular assist, the reasons and the surgical subspecialties that are consulting vascular surgery will vary by institution. However, the ability to use open endovascular and hybrid techniques does allow for vascular surgeons to consult and intervene in non-vascular cases when unexpected vascular compromise, iatrogenic injury, or challenging ex exposures are encountered. And what this does is emphasize that vascular surgery is an essential hospital resource, especially for institutions that provide urgent surgical care, and that it's important to ensure that trainees are comfortable with both open and endovascular techniques because when they're called to assist for their colleagues, they'll be using both to assist. So there were limitations to our study, primarily that the data was collected retrospectively and that um, we only focused on cases that occur within the operative suite. So any cases that may have been um, from interventionalists that occurred elsewhere wouldn't have been included in this study. Also, our data was not correlated with RDUs. These are our references. And this is my contact information if you have any questions or need to reach out. And now I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Soto, and congratulations on that talk. That was well done, and I think highlights essentially what we all encounter in our, our own practices. I think Dr. Belkin uh, and his address have come a long way, and uh, many of us reference that on a day-to-day -day basis in our own work. Um, I guess to start off, one question that I had was whether you could determine if some of these were trauma versus acute care surgery cases. I know that you said acute care, ortho, as well as um, cardiothoracic were the predominant specialties to call on help. Uh, but how does trauma fit into this realm, and, and where's the role of the vascular surgeon in today's trauma armamentarium? So in particular, the way our cases were categorized, any case that was categorized as trauma um, sort of comes up for us as acute care surgery. So it wasn't separated as whether it was um, a like a gen surge acute care case or if it was a trauma case. But as far as um, the way vascular surgery and trauma nowadays uh, plays a role together, um, I think the consensus is that people should be doing what they're best trained to be able to do and that if vascular surgery is available and is able to consult that they should be called. Thank you very much. Uh, the other question that comes up is uh, the, the overall denominator. Right now, your denominator was defined by those who were listed as a co-surgeon. Uh, what about those times when we're called into the OR to be available, give an opinion, but don't actually scrub and help out? Do you have a sense for how that might be caught in your study and enhance your data set? Unfortunately, you no, know, that's not, uh, based on the way that we collected the data, that's not something that we were able to include or able to explain. A couple of questions from the online site. First is from present courier. Should vascular surgeons use this information to negotiate with OR leadership for block time on standby, such as trauma is often given, like a standby trauma room? I think that they should be able to do that because since vascular surgery is able to be able to help out in any other cases that are going on throughout the hospital, for example, if something happens outside the ORs in an interventional suite where they're not already in the operating rooms, and they need to move over to the ORs, they should be able to have that access. Thank you. And then a question from uh, Dr. Jason Lee. How do we get this kind of data to our hospital leaders to assure we're not undervalued to the entire hospital system? And what would be the best metric to, to provide them with? I think collecting this data and presenting it to your hospital administration, I, for us, we were able to do it within our institution. And there's a couple of other institutions that have done similar work. Um, presenting that to your administration can help with negotiating. What was Thank the you. second half of the question? And so what is the to... best metric to present them with? I think from what I've seen, the best metric tends to be um, if you're able to correlate it with RVUs. Unfortunately, that wasn't something we were able to do here. I know that the uh, Society for Vascular Surgery is actually uh, currently uh, working where they have a working group on trying to define the value of the vascular surgeon overall. You know, can you put an RVU amount? Can you put a dollar amount? What is the value of the vascular surgeon to the institution? And I think your data would greatly support that argument that, that we need those on standby. So um, the other question I have to you then is, um, should we have vascular surgeons on call 24 seven in the hospital? 
or should there be a shift rotating so that somebody's always available and doesn't have to leave the OR to get called out? I think for larger academic institutions, maybe that have a higher volume, it does make sense to have a vascular surgeon available on call at least. Um, but for maybe smaller institutions, that doesn't seem like something that would be practical. And Dr. Uh, Gabriela Velasquez asks or says, hi, great presentation. Do you know if the vascular surgery faculty in your institution are also evaluating patients preoperatively for those that may anticipate help? Uh, has become a big issue at their institution, especially with surgical oncology, as well as urologic major resections. I um, guess I think what she's asking, like what's the preoperative, you know, consultation or, or planning process at your, pro at your institution? Yeah, for most of these cases, they were urgent or emergent, so they were going to the OR relatively soon. But for some of them, there was some form of like preoperative assessment that the vascular surgeon was informed ahead of time that they would need, they would be needed in the operating room. Yeah, I know that at our institution as well, we often meet, especially with our cardiothoracic surgery colleagues, our urologic oncologic surgery colleagues, uh, they'll often come well in advance and show us the disaster they're anticipating. And then one of us is, is more available on standby. Uh, but the trauma and acute care surgery, once that's a lot rare. Um, well, that's all the questions that we have online. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Corrier for our next presentation. Nice job again, and thank you. Thanks.